Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am asked to be very brief, which is a very difficult task for me, so I'll try my best to do that. Um, one of the things we think is, as you can tell, my, one of my assistants was very innovative because she's young and she's a social entrepreneur. It is, Ashoka is all about social entrepreneurs. And Ashoka was founded in uh, 1980, and the idea is for us to look for the leading social entrepreneurs, uh, the ones that are so committed to changing the world um, that we look for them and we try our best to find them and support them. We are the venture capitalist, uh, capitalists of the social sector. Um, as you see, we're interested in the Arab region. I am the regional director for the Arab region. The, the, program, was <clears throat> the program was launched in 2003 and we've been there for seven and a half years. We now have 53 fellows all over the world. And as you can see, our fellows, our Ashoka uh, social entrepreneurs that we select, we call them fellows because we believe we are all in one family of social entrepreneurs. The next. But who is a social entrepreneur? I have been hearing for the last seven years, actually for the last three years, when social entrepreneurship became more of a, a common thing in the region, people are talking about social entrepreneurs as business people with a social conscience or socially responsible businesses or NGOs that have economic sustainability. We don't think so. And since Bill Drayton, who founded Ashoka, was the one who coined the term, we have a special definition of what a social entrepreneur is. Okay, the best way to say who is a social entrepreneur is to give you an example of someone. Uh, and I chose, we have 53 fellows. We have actually three here. We have Lulwa and, uh, and Balsam, who are also social entrepreneurs from uh, Ashoka fellows from Kuwait. And Kamel is supposed to be here somewhere. He's also a social entrepreneur from Lebanon. He's going to speak after that. No, no, the one before. Okay, so who is Tamer Baha? Tamer Baha is uh, one of our first social entrepreneurs when we started in 2003, one of our first Ashoka fellows. He is both deaf and mute. He comes from um, um, disadvantaged economic background. And uh, in Egypt, uh, the, the schools in Egypt, especially for the deaf and mute, are not very encouraging. They don't teach the sign language. They don't teach them how to actually, 95% of those who graduate, graduate without knowing how to read and write. Uh, they're also only, the, the policy is that they are only allowed to be educated until the compulsory education, which is the third uh, preparatory, until they're 15. And they're not allowed uh, to do anything except the normal education system. The teachers do not know sign language. And, they, and the kids are obliged to learn how to read the lips. What is the result? The result is that out of the 3 million deaf and mute in Egypt, 95% cannot read and write. Really, 95%, and especially the one in 2003. 80% do not know a structured sign language. 90% of their families do not know the sign language. And uh, less than 1% of them went to university. But Tamer Baha had a different story, and he decided, and that's why we think he's a social entrepreneur. He was different because he, comp he insisted on completing his education. He was one of the very few who not only finished compulsory education, but went to high school as well. Not only this, he went to university and he graduated as one of the best. And he, not only did he do this, he was able to go to university, he was able to finish his education, and he was able to get a job with Chamberger, which for a guy like him with a very good salary would have meant, why should I bother? But he did care, and he wanted to do more. What did he do more? First of all, he translated the literacy program of the Egyptian government into a sign language. He got a camera, a very cheap camera, he got a friend of his, and they started a curriculum in sign language, the first ever in Egypt, which was done by photocopying, you know, just a camera, another guy with some signs, and photocopying and teaching kids on the cafes. Not only kids, but also adults who graduated from school. And he went to the public cafe, Ahwal Baladi, in Cairo, and started teaching. But life is not always rosy. Um, in Egypt and sometimes in the Middle East, the government decided you cannot teach literacy programs in the cafes. So they started harassing them. They started arresting him. Not only was he doing some favor, so he went to the government and said, what do I have to do? They said, you have to have an NGO. And in order to have an NGO, you have to have an apartment. And in order to have an apartment, um, you have to have 8,000 pounds. That was like 15 or 12 years ago. He went to every single deaf and mute he taught or he was teaching, or he was reading for, and he collected the 8,000 pounds, one pound at a time. And he was able to get 
the NGO started, he was able to start two, three classes. <coughs> so why is he a social entrepreneur? Tamer Bahat now was able, with the help of Ashoka, to have the curriculum for the deaf and mute all over Egypt, acknowledged by the government, to have uh, more than 400 of, uh, deaf and mute people graduate and go into uh, computer classes, because now he started this. He was able also, because the deaf and mute marry from each other, to, and they were unable to translate whatever the problems were when they went to hospitals or to the court system, he was able to start volunteer centers in hospitals from university graduates and from volunteers so that they know the sign language and they can translate to the, to the doctors, and sometimes in the court cases. And Tamer Bahat was able to start the first uh, alarm clock that is by vibes that is locally made in Egypt through the, his group of the deaf and mute. That is a social entrepreneur. He's a leader, he's a pioneer, no, no. He's a visionary and a change maker. What we say is a social entrepreneur is somebody who's committed to a cause, he wants to make it a, a difference, he, is, he has started or she has started and they don't give up, they are tenacious. How do we pick them? Well, we have a very strict way of picking them with something called targeted venture, we identify the root problems through mapping, through our friends, through the people we know, through a network of nominators. And we also identify the persons, CSOs, we call them citizen sector organizations, but the persons behind these uh, CSOs, and we manage to do that. We create a, a fellow profile, we have a second opinion review, we have a local regional panel, and the board decision. What we're trying to say here is that this is due diligence. Our social entrepreneurs, the 53 Arabs in the Arab region, whom we have chosen the last seven and a half years, are the leading social entrepreneurs. There was mapping of the sectors, there were recommendations, there were verification, verification missions, there was a lot of work that has been done. Uh, they were judged and tortured by local, regional, international uh, committees and judges from the social and the business sector and they have been given a lot of different support types of support that we've talked about now. What do we do with them? We give them a lot of support. As I said, we're the venture capitalists of the social sector, so not only some of them get a stipend to focus on their ideas, but a lot of networking, visibility, training, capacity building, and the most important thing is what we call the collaborative platforms, where the fellows work together so that we can leverage whatever they have done so that they can really have a higher impact and scale up. These are the types of fellow services, and I will leave it for the questions. And are they only for, for non-profit? Because you know, your NGOs, are you only dealing with women's issues, the, the orphans? No. We have fellows who are for-profit, fellows who are non-for-profit, not for profit. We have fellows that are covering their costs, and we have fellows that have franchised their ideas and causes. So, a social entrepreneur is any one of them, as long as there is a social cause at the beginning, and that is the driving force. What are the challenges we face? The political environment, donor-driven society, no celebration of individual talent, and no Arab word for social entrepreneurs. By the way, it took us a whole year with a lot of sessions at the beginning to, to try to find a word in Arabic. And is it Riyadh? Is it Ibda'amub Da'iktima'i? What was it exactly? Up to now, there are differences in the region, but we try to explain it by saying who is a social entrepreneur. We are having a, a lot of, let's say, difficulties for CSO, citizen sector organizations in different Arab countries. And we still do not have a clear understanding between the business and the social sector of what we really want to do as social entrepreneurs. We still, or in spite of all the advancement and progress that the business sector is doing, we're still facing a big problem when we want the business sector and the social sector to really bridge the gap and work together. Uh, one of the main problems I faced at the beginning when I, wanted, when I was hired was you will not find social entrepreneurs in the Middle East. We did. But when we have 53 and we have a waiting list, and everybody said, are you sure you want to be responsible for the Arab world? Maybe you want to take another country. Maybe you go to Pakistan and in, in India. Now, I love Pakistan and India, but I wanted to start where I come from. However, the real problem we have with our social entrepreneurs is the leverage, is the scaling up. And there will not be a scaling up. And the reasons why I came here was for this reason. There will never be a scaling up unless the business sector decides to think of the social entrepreneurs as, as an investment possibility. To think of it as a venture. 
and to think of the long-term gains that they will make. Only then will we be able to scale up. Because what the social entrepreneurs need from the business sector is not only the money, which is important, but mainly how to do things. How to do a business plan. We've been asked by several of the biggest companies to come and say, okay, do your business plans or ask your fellows to do a business plan. And it's not that easy if you come from the social sector. We have never done business plans before. And yes, we improvise. Yes, we go and get a company, and it's extremely expensive to do that. So anyway, that's what we need from the business sector. The social entrepreneurs need the business sector to come in as equal partners and to understand that there is a long-term gain economically, not only socially. This is some of the things we've done. Some of the models, market-based uh, market solution is housing for all, and we can leave this to the discussion. And what we say always, and this is our founder, he says, social entrepreneurs are not content just to give a fish or teach how to fish. They want to revolutionize the fishing industry. These are the social entrepreneurs. And I'll stop at that, and we're open for questions if anybody wants to ask. If not, we can go and have coffee. They think that no one in the Arab world is interested in developing the, the social sector, or what? Why exactly? Well, first of all, that was said. I was told this like eight years ago. Number one. Number two. No, because social entrepreneurs are not just development people. You know. Okay. The question was why did why were I why was I told that there are no social entrepreneurs in the Middle East or the Arab world? And my answer was that this was eight years ago. That a social entrepreneur was a term that nobody understood when I started eight years ago. Um, up till now, when I go to places, I'm still called Anushka instead of Ashoka. So, I mean, it's still difficult. <laughs> and uh, and um, so it's not that easy, number one. Number two, a social entrepreneur is a pioneer in the field. We have a five, five criteria that are very strict. It has to be his or her idea. They have to be innovators. They have to be creative people who started to and, and found the problem and decided to solve it. Um, they have to be cre creative, entrepreneurial, they don't give up. And for a long period in the Middle East, we have been donor, I mean, I can talk about Egypt, for example, and Jordan, where I know them very well. It has been always, the development sector has been donor driven. People come in with identified problems and they come in and you, m many of the NGOs would only respond to that. There is a gap between the business sector and the social sector. Uh, the business sector always believed that NGOs are charity oriented or not to trust and, and a lot of the NGOs did not believe that they could trust the business sector. Now there has been a lot of improvement in the last eight years. But the idea is, and people believe that usually social entrepreneurs only evolve when there is a little bit of more political freedom. Which I think otherwise. I think whenever there are problems, you find the entrepreneurs. Whenever there is no political freedom, that's why you have a lot of entrepreneurs in the Arab region, when there are no political freedoms, when there are many restraints and constraints, then you find the entrepreneurs. But that was the reason. Hi, Iman. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Natasha, and I'm from the King Khalid Foundation. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to um, the, the problems that you're finding in, the, in Jordan and Egypt are, are even worse in, in the Gulf region. We find that it's, it's extremely difficult to explain social entrepreneurship and what it is and what it means. What do you think should be done to, to engage people more in understanding it and, and maybe to engage the business sector more to be open to it? Thank you. Well, I was trying to be politically correct by saying only in Egypt and Jordan. It's everywhere in the region, and we agree. And I think that, well, first of all, partner with Ashoka. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but what I also think is what helped us in many of the countries, we work in seven of the countries in the region now, and what helped us was to identify the social entrepreneurs, to celebrate the social entrepreneurs, and to make them more visible. Now, in some countries, we cannot be there unless we have a partner. You know, and, and, and some others we can just go there. And, and many of them we went in and we collaborated with a lot of the local social entrepreneurs. But also, it's the media and the networking and the visibility. It's what I call sometimes it's or, uh, events like this one or round tables. That's what we have been doing. We've been really partnering with a lot of the business sector organizations. We've been trying to work with them. We've been trying to introduce them to our fellows. And it's a dialogue. And, and really the media. If you get a very you know, good media, then you can do it. The, no, the, the gentleman beside Nadia, and then the young girl.
Hello, I'm Engineer Targi Shatri. I'm uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia, from Riyadh, and I work in a uh, battery incubator. I have a question here. Don't you think about the business uh, or about uh, what you call it, uh, private sector? If we provide them with the case studies uh, and the profit of that case studies, then they will jump. Uh, okay, we say that there is a so, uh, social responsibility, but if we join the social responsibility and also uh, told them that there is an income, a great income, then they will jump. The problem is that we don't provide them with, with enough, at least from uh, in Riyadh, we don't provide them with enough case study, private case studies. So, okay. I have three answers to your question. I mean, three parts. The first one is sometimes the profit is not um, it is not a dollar to the to a cent to the dollar and it's not immediate for example the housing for all the housing for all program is a program where we break even in 40 months and we make profit in in five to six years however and we've submitted it to a lot uh, uh, with a business plan actually i've learned how to do a business plan with a cash flow and everything but the fact that they know your resident sector organization to start with people don't even read so there is this gap that you need to cover, and in Saudi Arabia in particular, and some places in the Gulf. In addition, you need to start a dialogue, because in order for you to have access to the private sector, it's not that easy. You might either go to, uh, you know, there is a need to have more open discussions and dialogues between the social sector and the private sector, because we, there is a need to, for us to have the same language, and we don't. For example, when we say a social benefit, we don't mean a social, I mean, it is a social and economic return, but it's in seven to 10 years. It's a long-term investment where not everybody's interested in that. Sometimes, for example, something like the housing for all, we're, not, we're saying we don't want the CSR of the company because we want them to look at it as an investment. However, in order for them to understand that, they need to give us the time. And time is what the social sector needs. Not only Ashoka, I'm talking about all the social entrepreneurs. Time is what we need. The time from not an employee who has to do a plan for CSR in his company, but the manager or, or the mentor of the organization that wants to give time, to provide time so that they can discuss this with the social entrepreneurs. This is not available and it's not easy. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's just a quick question. Does social entrepreneurship necessarily mean uh, linkages with the private sector? Does it have to be linked with uh, social uh, responsibility? So social entrepreneurship, to my understanding, could be something that's done within a social framework entirely with that, without necessarily a business uh, a model linked to it. Of course, it has nothing to do with a business model. What we're saying is a social entrepreneur is someone, like Tamir had nothing to do with the business sector, for example, if he were here. A social uh, entrepreneur is somebody who is committed to a social cause, who is, who has, who, who he or she uh, is tenacious, they don't want to give up, they have a solution that is innovative and different, and they are going to tackle every venue to reach their goals. However, a social entrepreneur, and he is or she is a pioneer in their model, they have to think of two things that are very important and differs them from development, in the general of development. First, they have to think of sustainability, not necessarily financial sustainability. And this is where we and the private sector need to, to have a lot of dialogues. Sustainability of the idea, of the cause. They have to think of the economic return in the long term. For example, for, for the deaf and mute, now we have 400 deaf and mute who are productive, who are working, who are gaining an income, who are not, you know, an add-ons. Now that is a long term. Uh, uh, it, it took Tamir four or five years, but these people are productive community members. They are paying their taxes. Seriously, because only the middle class pay their taxes. But anyway, so, so they are paying their taxes and their dues. So that's one thing. And, and so, only, and that's the, the reason why we want the private sector to be partners is because we believe as Ashoka that the public sector has really um, undermined the competitiveness of the, the social sector. Going to governmental donors or having partnership with big uh, organizations have made, you, have made the social sector not as competitive as they should be. And we need some of the tools of the private sector. Um, okay, sorry. No, please go ahead. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Ziad Makawi. Um, you know, the whole area of uh, social entrepreneurship is obviously a, you know, it's not, uh, it's very difficult to define. And um, the way that you've defined it um, makes it sound to me like it's, you know, on a spectrum of somebody who, you know, just wants to have something which is breaking even and sustainable and providing a social good. And on the other hand of the spectrum, there's, you know, the company that wants to be a very profitable company, uh, but that also uh, provides some social benefit. And in that spectrum, uh, when you go to the business, to the private sector, uh, and you position yourself all the way, if you will, to the left of that, my left, I guess, which is social. If you make money in five years, then that's great. Uh, I think is maybe uh, a dangerous way to kind of try to go after the, 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 the private sector, because ultimately the private sector will be motivated by the profit. And uh, so I don't know if you can comment on that, on how, where do you draw the line? When you say five years and seven years, I can tell you that, you know, people uh, from, a, from a, a private sector, if you remove the social, you know, I want to do social good, you know, people, you know, will, will have a difficulty with that kind of a time frame. So just if you can comment on, you know, why you're positioning it, I think, sorry, just I'll, I'll make my own kind of comment, which is, I think it's better to, to position yourself more on the profit side with a social impact um, uh, than where you are right now? Okay. This is exactly our problem. <laughs> that I haven't re re really said my, my clarity. I wasn't clear about my message. No, we are not for profit. The social entrepreneur is someone who wants to solve a social problem. A business a business that has a social cause, a business that wants to do something good, is a business that wants to do something good. This is their CSR. These are good people who care about the environment, that care about their employees, and they're wonderful people and we love them, but these are not social entrepreneurs. A social entrepreneur, these are business entrepreneurs with good qualities, with ethical fiber. The social entrepreneur is someone who from the day, from the inception of the idea was worried about a social cause, was interested in a social cause. And I'm sorry, that is why we're there. We want to educate the private sector, that they need these social entrepreneurs, because that's how, for example, one of the meetings we had in Egypt, and a guy was working about the environment and the Nile and the pollution in the Nile, and just to make things funny, as I like doing most of the time, uh, we told him, we told the business guy, you need him because if the water is completely polluted and people will not live, then nobody will buy your, your product. So what I'm saying is that this is what we want to do. We are talking about social entrepreneurs. We're talking about entrepreneurs that have a social cause as their, their catalyst, as their core being, and they're thinking of different types of sustainability. Now, we are trying to get them to be financially sustainable as well, but that is not necessarily the case. If they are sustainable uh, environmental, if they are sustainable in the sense that they are spreading something. For example, if someone is working on battered women or somebody is working on human rights, he is still a social entrepreneur if he's innovative or she's innovative and they're trying to lead to systemic change. Now, it is for the benefit of everyone to have a better framework for human rights, including the private sector. Uh, and, and that's what we want to educate. Uh, we're running out of time, so we'll be taking two more questions, if we're lucky, three. So please, if we okay, can keep it short. She's been asking for a long there. time. Yes. And, and he's been asking for a long time. Yeah. She's a fellow. Uh, and he wants. Jumana Javri. Um, I come from both corporate, government, and uh, non-profit uh, world, and I find that the, the bridging is quite difficult to make. Now, uh, the, one of the main problems, actually, of, uh, of uh, the bridging is uh, legality. When you go and, and register, you only have the option of either being a profit-making or a non-profit. And as soon as you register as a non-profit, then you're in the cycle of trying to find funding and so on, which is quite a difficult one and a time-consuming one, which keeps you from uh, uh, having enough time to actually focus on how to move your non-profit into a sustainable and eventually a social entrepreneurship rather than just a social uh, uh, point. So, um, so what, what are the legalities that actually allow for that? And, um, and is Ashoka part of uh, that system that allows that? Okay. Can you ask uh, his question? Can you take his question to so another? I'll answer all of them. I'm inspiring to listen to you particularly. I love the humor, so keep it Thank on. But just a question for you. 
um, how many jobs you have created under all of these ventures, and what sort of an investment you do in, in, in such funds and uh, basically in such startups. And I think this blurry line of profitable, non-profitable is something which we have to overcome, all of us, no, because that's the barrier. When you look at pret a manger in London, which sold its stake to McDonald's, they were giving their food, the leftovers at night, to homeless people in London. So it doesn't have to start in a black and white uh, space, I guess, you know, so you can start profitable and then become <laughs> social entrepreneur and it, it, does, it doesn't have to be one or the other. That's just a comment. Thank you. Well, first of all, I, I would like to add that although social entrepreneurship as a concept came from the United States, the most advanced country in the world is England with the community trusts and the housing trusts and I mean the understanding of social entrepreneurship and social enterprise. Um, the legality, yes, we help. And one of the things we're doing and trying to promote and working with a lot of people in the West and in the Middle East and everywhere else, actually in the Arab world, I don't like, you know, in the Arab world, is really trying to do a social investment framework. And, you know, anybody who's interested, there are our fellows that I'm abusing here, if you can give us, if you can give us me or them, your, your numbers and your email, because we have a paper and we've been trying to work on it. We have something called the Arab World Social Innovation Forum that we have every year where we try to really push for that. One of the things we try to push is market-based solutions and also a social investment framework where all these things are, are, are um, separate. What do, how many, we've changed, not us, our fellows changed 13 policies. You know, pro policies that encourage different things in the last seven years. And we, the last thing, which was in 2008, um, eight, nine, um, there were more than 14,000 jobs in Egypt alone that were created directly and indirectly by our fellows. And by the way, we do put measures and indicators, and, and these are something that you can prove, and we're not making them up. Uh, but we don't know about Morocco and Lebanon and the other countries yet. We were able to do it in Egypt because we have more uh, fellows. There are many questions. I know when you, I'm out of time, yes, right? Yes, I'm, I'm really sorry. I mean, we have to respect the schedule. Iman, thank you very much. This was indeed very inspiring. Thank you for being with us today and sharing with us all these stories.